Judy Panolis, your host for Books at Berkeley. Today we welcome Linda Monick, who has been an associate professor of dance at the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley since 2019. She teaches Introduction to Dance and Dance History. Linda has lectured on dance history since 2017 at the Boston Ballet School and lectures on new works at the Joyce Theater. She has taught dance history in New Mexico and New York and Connecticut and has written for Dance Teacher Now, Ballet News and Choreography of Dance Journals. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with you a little bit about some of the resources that you like at the Berkeley Library. And I was wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about Medici TV and um, what is it and why do you use it? So, so I want to start by saying thank you. And you were also, of course, my source of maps for my introduction to dance class. Um, I just want to say that when you teach dance history, one of the challenges, as a woman who was one of the dance scholars at Jacob's Pillow said, if you can't get clips of the work, and you can only show two minutes of something. It's like showing one corner of a painting and saying, this is a Matisse. And so Medici TV is a streaming site that gives, well, everybody at Berkeley, not just the dancers, but everybody access to full works, which is very, very difficult to find. I have you know, a bookcase full of DVDs uh, in our apartment that I've used for years and years, plus old VHS tapes, because it is very difficult to get full works on um, dance that students have access to. So when I found out about this, Stacy Snyder knows because she's come to every single one of my dance history classes and now introduction to dance classes to teach the students how to use it. Because even the upperclassmen that I've had had no idea that Medici was available to them. So it really solves the issue because most students are coming in to BOCO, depending on where they live, they may have never seen a full length 19th century ballet. They know about it, but they may have never seen it. So they have also perhaps never heard of more contemporary choreographers. So it gives them the opportunity to, to look at full length works by both modern choreographers, contemporary choreographers, uh, beautiful 19th century ballets um, that are sort of the, the canon of, of ballet. And the other thing I wanna add is for anyone who has had to deal with YouTube clips, which are basically, depending on who's uploaded it, are kind of pirated tapes, right? Um, the quality can be really uneven. So yes, you can find a few great, beautifully filmed, but what you're getting on Medici, whether you're talking about opera or ballet or symphony concerts, they are beautifully filmed. They are beautifully filmed, which also makes a huge difference as we learned in lockdown when everything switched to online and companies started streaming more and more and more, how something is filmed really has an impact on how you see the work. So Medici TV for me has been a lifesaver. So one of the questions I've had about that, about dance is sort of the view that the, uh, the viewer has of the stage and of the dance, because obviously there's some elements you want to see in detail or close up. <laughs> and some that just like it's just like the cat uh and some that you you know you want to see the whole stage and sort of the effect you know from back and are, are those elements uh you know uh how are those fitting into the kind of views that you're getting and Medici tv is it some where the camera is always at the back or do you get these close-ups no. these are thoughtfully edited multi-camera i mean it's interesting because when we lived in new mexico one of my first dear great friends was the late Merrill Brockway. Now, a lot of his work, by the way, is on Dance Online, Dance and Video. Merrill Brockway pioneered with Emil Ardolino, Dance in America. And so many of the videos we have about 20th century dance is because of Merrill. And he 
had rules that he developed with Emil when they did Dance in America. He said, you know, never show just the feet, never show just the pace. I mean, how do you keep a dance phrase, show the choreography, but not have everything always shot from the back? And so right. what we're seeing, especially with digital work, we're seeing far more sophisticated filming of dance that manages to balance, you know, being able to really see the dancers, um, but also pulling back far enough that you can see the architecture. Because something I promised you, most of the students um, have not thought about is the architecture of dance. What are the patterns in the space, right? Where are they going? How do you see that architecture? And so what happens with these bigger ballets is, you know, Medici can pull back far enough when they film it. So you see, you know, 10 dancers, my favorite is to show Sleeping Beauty. You have four dancers going this way, four dancers going this way, and then they do a zigzag downstage and then they go into a full circle and you can really see that architecture. So when I say spatial architecture, they, they understand what I'm talking about. You know, yeah, that's one of my favorite aspects of watching ballet is kind of the, the, the floating nature of how all this form and shape changes all the time. I wanted, wanted to know, um, how can you name kind of an impact that you felt you've had or seen your students have as a result of watching these programs? Um, oh, and- many, yes. Again, it's having access to full length work. So with my dance history students um, last year, we were talking about the, the, the original versions of you know, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, Giselle, and then the wildly contemporary versions. And happily, um, I was talking about the young Swedish choreographer, Alexander Ekman. So he has just done a new Swan Lake called A Swan Lake that is wild. It is wild. So I was talking about it. And so a bunch of my students went into Medici and watched the full work. Some of them looped back to watch the original Swan Lake to see how he was tweaking, you know, the famous act two swan, you know, the white swan scene. And it's hilarious because he has like, you know, 5,000 gallons of water on the stage um, in the Ekman work. So, so it, for, the students who are really curious, it gives them the tools to watch not only the originals, but then very contemporary work. You know, there's also Yuri Killian is online, Akram Khan, there's works by Akram Khan. We talked a lot about the um, Rameau opera ballet, Les Angolans. There's not one, but two versions on Medici. One is directed and choreographed by the very contemporary, very important Belgian choreographer, C.D. Larby Cherkoui. So they can go in and look at that. So I showed them like three different versions of Les Angles Galant. And it's incredible to be able to do that. They can see Diaghilev's Ballet Russe and then contemporary versions of the Ballet Russe. Um, yesterday, I have to say in class, this just happened, this just happened. We're, you know, in intro to dance, we're talking about, you know, dance in North Africa and the Middle East. And I showed your maps, I showed your maps, Ottoman Empire maps. Um, and then we were talking about the 19th century Orientalism, mm-hmm. right? Filtered through the French choreographer who was at the Imperial Ballet in Russia for like 50 years, Maurice Petipa. So I was showing clips of Fida Pharaoh, daughter of the Pharaoh which is on Medici in full. There were some very uncomfortable things, a group of young dancers in full blackface in a sort of classic Baroque grotesque role. So we had a big discussion about that. But then afterwards, the students said, a bunch of them raised their hand and I said, what? They said, well, we've learned some of these variations. It's just nobody ever told us which ballet it was from. Mm. So, You have kids working in a vacuum, learning the steps, but not learning the name or the importance of the work that they're dancing. And so it was hilarious for me because there's this one big variation and sort of, you know, it's supposed to be in in Egypt and it's an opium dream. You know, we've covered like 
five opium dreams this week in 19th century ballet. And, you know, this grand, very classical variation in the middle of this Egyptian ballet. Well, and they're saying, oh no, that's done in competitions all the time. They are never told the title, the music, the history, the context, nothing. Wow. So for them, and I said, okay, this is online. This is available to you online. So as we sort of move through intro to dance and then next semester when we get to dance history, they will have every time that I give them an information sheet with links to the works that we're talking about. And so as we get into, you know, Frederick Ashton, George Balanchine, we have all these, I put all these links in from Medici so they can see the full works because what I've also heard is they know the name. Okay, so this is the equivalent of saying, well, I know the name Michelangelo, but I just don't have an idea about what the painting or sculpture looks like. Right. Right. Yeah. Or they'll say they have opinions about Balanchine and then they confess that they've actually never seen a full Balanchine ballet. Wow. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, it, it isn't really about history. It's about work that's being done right now and then the links to the past, right? That it is, it is a tradition that has evolved and how do we show how that tradition has evolved? We show it by showing the work, <laughs> right? You don't talk about it, you have to be able to show it. Right, you have to be able to see it. And this context that you, you know, you're able to give your students uh, both his, you know, the historical context with the older works and seeing these you know, very classic ballets as well as these contemporary works to sound you know that you could do the comparison between uh different interpretations sounds really interesting to me and i'm wondering how does that um carry over to this other resource we have dance online and dance and video uh, it's part of a greater series that we have of alexander street press um, has databases throughout the library on a variety of things, classical music, dance, and so on. Um, do you, uh, can you tell the viewers of this video um, how you use dance online in class? Is, is it kind of in the same way that you're using Medici TV? Yes, depending on the topic. So I can tell you exactly one of the more heartbreaking examples um, we were talking, there, there are a lot of, there, it's great because there's a lot of clips of dance in India, dance in Cambodia, dance in China. All of these clips are on their information sheets. But when I spoke about dance in Southeast Asia, I really wanted them to understand that um, dance was almost erased by the Khmer Rouge. So on Dance Online, Dance and Video, there's a program done oddly by my late friend, Meryl Brockway, about the Cambodian court ballet in 1971. Mm. There is also, so if everybody will recall, the Khmer Rouge moved in in 1976, and that's when you know the genocide really began. So you see these dancers from 1971, and then also on Dance Online is a documentary called The Tenth Dancer about the attempt to bring back Cambodian dance when nine out of 10 artists were killed by the Khmer Rouge. Wow. So it, it doesn't get more immediate than that, no. you know, because it, it shows you how close Cambodia came to losing um, this precious art form that goes back thousands of years, right? And wow. the attempt to rebuild it, bringing dancers back from the camps to reconstitute it. And then of course, which is not available anywhere, and that's not true on Amazon, there is a, a documentary called Dancing Across Borders about a young Cambodian dancer who was seen by a board member of New York City Ballet. And she looked at him and decided that he needed to be in ballet because he had no future in Cambodia. Well, so to put that into the mix and say, when we talk about this assumption that ballet is the most important dance form in the world, this kind of shows you ballet really created as an art form, mid 17th century um, Cambodian court dance 
has roots from thousands of years ago. It was just, it's just this disconnect, this assumption that this young male dancer who was part of a Cambodian court dance company, as Cambodian court dance was being rebuilt, he's kind of plucked out and sent to a ballet school in New York where he'd never even seen ballet. So, so having the access to these is a really, really immediate way. I don't even have to say anything. I'm like, okay, here's this clip. Let's count the dancers, 1971. How many dancers were in this group? If there are 10 dancers, it means probably only one or two of them survived. Wow. It's so scary to think about the fact how, on one level, how fragile culture is that, you know, we do need to have it come down to us and be taught by the people who are the ones that are doing it, not just seeing it on a video. You, you can't, you can't learn everything you need to know without the teacher and without the transmission of that culture. So we're very fortunate in a situation like that, that there were people who were able to do that, to reconstitute it and bring it back. Yeah. Build oh, a generation of dancers who know that tradition, that ancient tradition. Um, and also on Dance Online, you have a, a lot of these sort of classic videos of, um, of, of choreographers and also uh, besides the classics, uh, contemporary videos. And I'm wondering um, this instant access to the classics uh, with young dancers today, um, I wonder about how they view, you know, how, what are you seeing how students are viewing classic dance in terms of their own experience um, in, in today's, you know, context? Um, I think that there's just so much they don't know. There's, there's just so much, they know bits. They know variations. You know, I asked yesterday, how many of you know, um, you know, Petty Paws, Paquita, right? Um, what they don't know is 20th and 21st century work, typically. And so for me, the most important thing is filling in those gaps. Again, to go back to balancing something that is on dance online, dance and video, which I cannot believe exists is the balancing trust has as part of Alexander Street has all of these coaching videos. I was going to ask you about that. The 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 teaching instructional videos. Oh, it, yes, mine. it's unbelievable because one of the things anybody who's dance knows is is this idea of taught from person to person and every choreographer admits that it's not gonna, you know, Petty Paw, the 19th century ballets that we see now um, are not exactly how they would have been seen in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. So even with something like George Balanchine who died in 1983, um, there's been a huge effort to keep his works very pure. Mm -hmm. And so what is online and I showed to our dancers, we had, um, a ballet teacher, Ty Jimenez, who used to dance with um, Dance Theater of Harlem. There is a tape on Dance Online Dancing Video of Arthur Mitchell, the great Arthur Mitchell, who created Dance Theater of Harlem, who was the first black male principal dancer at New York City Ballet, on whom George Balanchine made the Stravinsky Ballet Agon. And it was a little bit shocking at the time because he danced with the white dancer, Diana Adams in this extraordinary work. So what we have, Dance Online, Dance and Video, is Arthur Mitchell coaching Ty Jimenez in Agon. Wow. And so for my students to see their faculty member, I mean, sadly, she's not with us this year, but to see that, so it isn't just me saying, Arthur Mitchell is important, Dance Theater of Harlem is important, um, the work Mitchell did with New York City Ballet is important, here is Mitchell teaching what he learned directly from George Balanchine. Well, I mean, that, and, that's the, the chain of tradition. Right, and right, right. Just right in front of you there. Uh, and for our students to be able to see that is just, it's just amazing. It's just really re 
remarkable. And I hope that they'll be able to take advantage of that and see as much as they can uh, with these remarkable things. Uh, one of the great uh, features of Dance Online also with Alexander Street, and this goes for all of their products, is this ability to make clips. And I know that you spoke deeply about the importance of seeing the entire ballet, but I also wanted to know how you might use clips, or if you do, in your classroom from the software that allows students to save or teachers to save these clips for themselves to review uh, sections of the ballet. And uh, if that's been a part of the instruction at all. I have to confess, I have not used that yet because I think it's a little cumbersome to go in. I have my own collection at home. Oh, okay. That I tend to, you know, put my timings in, pull it up, you know, they laugh at me when I come in with my external DVD drive, you know, it's like, I look like a dinosaur, right? However, yeah. it's what's easiest for me. But last year for their final presentations, which because it was smaller groups and they, their task was to analyze a work. This was for both dance history and for introduction to dance, show, show a clip and discuss the dance elements in that clip. And so a lot of my students did use um, dance online, dance and video and pull the clips from that. I mean, famously Hans von Manen, who's this incredible Dutch choreographer who is, his work is not performed that much anymore but he was hugely important throughout Europe and the US in terms of his influence on contemporary ballet. And I was so pleased that they pulled these clips from dance online, dance and video. That's great. Because it's a great, it's a great way, to, it's a great way to use it. Because as we all know, anybody who's used used YouTube, which I resisted for years and years, hence my bookcase of DVDs, um, uh, it disappears. Right, clips disappear daily, 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 off of YouTube. I can look at it on Sunday night, and by Monday afternoon, it's gone. Wow. So what this does is give. And what I always do, for example, they're working, Intro to Dance is working on an assignment right now to analyze a dance from either China or Japan. Dance Online, Dance and Video has these incredible clips of traditional dance in China with context, with information, and then really beautiful performance clips. So we've sort of gone through the context in class and I've shown your maps, you know, to place everything, where are all the borders, who is where, what's where, but then they go in and they have to look at one to two minutes of movement and describe it. My rule is it's not, I don't really care if you like it or you don't like it. Your job is to look at it and describe what you see in terms of movement, gesture, dynamics, use of space, um, relationship to the music, all of that. And it's hard. I asked them yesterday, I said, how's it going? They said, it's really hard to, yeah. to, de to describe dance. So we have decided they may upload um, photos of spatial patterns or specific gestures, you know, and little stick figures that they can draw because it's a hard task, but that's what makes them understand what makes a form of dance unique and special. And what are the differences between looking at, you know, a dance from, you know, Bouteau, Japan versus a traditional Chinese dance, they can they begin to train their eye to look. And that is maybe for me, the most important thing in all of this and having Medici and having dance online and then, then having the support. We just looked at it, you know, we cover very problematic um, work in class. You know, we just looked at the ballet Petrushka, very famous ballet Russe work. One of the sections is the Moor. And it's this kind of barbaric view of a Moor in his room as a puppet in the ballet Petrushka in full blackface. So I was able to go to the articles online and put in their reading the history of black Moors in fine art in Europe, in the Baroque, and that kind of um, patronizing view. Mm. But so they could read about it and look at the work. Of course, the vote was you know, no, this should never be done. Um, but it they have access to an article that then puts that section of Petrushka in context. 
right? So it's using, all, it's for me, it's using all of these threads because, you know, dance history books don't talk about the complication of um, presenting work that in the past four years, everyone is talking about what do we do with these works? What do we do with these works? And this gives me um, scholarly articles plus the works in order to have a sort of fully informed discussion about it. And it gives them a way if they wanna learn more about something to dig more deeply with a combination of um, articles and video, which is, is like dying and going to heaven for somebody who teaches dance history, yeah. you know, frankly. I mean, you can really lose yourself for hours and hours and hours in these databases. I mean, believe me, just looking at them, uh, you know, in prepar preparation of talking to you, I was like, I can spend like a lifetime in, this, in these resources because they're so fascinating. There's so much here and there's so much context that you can get uh, just knowing with and understanding the basics to the much more sophisticated and nuanced uh, variations that you can get through watching these videos and learn. Well, that's what the students say. They say, oh yes, I, st I, I signed on. I mean, once they know about it. Right. Right, and this is true for dance online too, but once they know about it, you know, I get these notes. Well, my rabbit hole this weekend <laughs> was, because it's really true. You know, you're looking for one thing and it's like there's, Frederick Ashton's Midsummer Night's Dream, which is sort of the classic, beautiful royal ballet, but now the young Alexander Ekman, who now we're all obsessed with, um, there is his version of Midsummer Night's Dream on Medici. So you can toggle back and forth between the 19th century Coppelia and Maggie Moran's 20th century Coppelia set in a French housing project. Wow. Right. I mean, so it gives you that ability to go down those rabbit holes and then, you know, God knows what else. And I also think this is a tool and I'm just going to say this as a, as a dance person for classical music majors to see some of these works that were made by Stravinsky for ballet. Um, Mark Morris's use of Handel's L'Allegro. Um, it also kind of broadens their view, if you will, to look at how classical music is used in dance. And I think, plus they can then, and I can, same thing for dancers. I was just talking about Aida and, you know, we certainly dig into Les Angolans, but they can go in and look at opera on Medici. And I bet you almost none of them have thought about going in and looking at opera right? If it's not part of their, you know, world, then why would they? But this makes it so easy for them. They can be in their pajamas at home in their dorm room with a cup of coffee, and they can just, as you say, jump into that rabbit hole and find a bunch of things. Yeah, you know? I find it very appealing. And, you know, it, it, in sort of this post-COVID era, when people are kind of, kind of coming out of it, but we're still in it, and we're, we're not sure exactly where we are. Um, I'm finding that a lot of students really need to get off of, you know, they, they tell me they need to get off of the social media and do something else. And this is a fantastic way to not only enlighten yourself and en enhance your own, you know, background, but it's also a way to kind of get lost in something beautiful and uh, meaningful in a way that's not, that's not, uh, you know, at, agitating you with whatever's going on in the social media world there. And, um, and it's their art. It's form. just a wonderful uh, alternative. Yeah. And it, and it gives them, you know, we talk about the issue of attention spans because of TikTok, right? That, that, you know, half minute, one minute clips. And so my argument is, so when I work for ballet schools, whether it's School of American Ballet in New York or Walnut Hill or Boston Ballet School, I say, you know, this, everything I'm talking about is currently in repertory, is currently being danced. So this isn't really about history. This is about 
you knowing enough that when it comes time for you to audition, you have to know the repertory, you have to know the ballads, yeah. right? And this is true for modern dancers too. You know, what kind of a company do you want to be in? If you don't know about the choreographers, how are you going to make a choice? And the other, uh, you know, just it takes time to really, you know, build that knowledge base. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You have to constantly being building it a little bit at a time. And this is a really easy way to do that with. The constant, you know, the variety of things that you can watch on these, these resources, you can constantly be building your knowledge base, uh, you know, and getting that background and getting that information and seeing things and making sure that you've, you've got, you know, a very wide swath of information, you know, past, yeah. you know, not just the narrow immediate concerns, but a very, very broad aspect of uh, dance. Well, these- one of my students last semester, because I do these big information sheets, your maps have ended up on my information sheets, <laughs> where I give, you know, the reading, but also the clips, the links. Mm-hmm. And so I said to them, you should be keeping downloading onto your own computer in your own file, separate from Google Classroom, the information that you find the most interesting so you can go back in. And so sure enough, you know, I had one student last year, freshman last year, who's, you know, this brilliant young student. She said, oh, I'm downloading all of them. Then I ran into a student after the performance on Saturday. And she said, um, can, you, can you send me, if I send you the ones I went, can you send them to me? I said, absolutely, absolutely. Because I, what I want them to know is that if I'm going to go to all this work to pull these links from Medici and Dance Online or wherever, I want them to keep that as a resource because even if Medici takes it down, they can go into Medici and they'll find something else. And what Stacy always says, which I think is so important, it's such an important reminder, Stacy always says, and remember, it's your tuition that is paying for this. Once you graduate, you will no longer have access to Medici or dance online. So right. do your homework now. Do your homework now. Do your research now. Take advantage, full advantage. Full advantage of it. Because they have this thing about, oh, it's academic. And I'm like, it is not academic if you're going to be dancing some of this stuff. Right? right. It is not academic. It's immediate concern. It's immediately valuable. Yeah, completely. So, you know, as you can see, I am a huge fan of it because it just gives me the ability to say, even because, you know, it's a short semester, both semesters are short semesters. I only have so much time and I'm covering hundreds of types of dance, not hundreds, but scores of types of dance in one class, you know, global dance forms. And then the other is is a very much more narrow view of um, modern, you know, 19th to 21st century ballet and modern dance. Very narrow. Um, But this gives me the ability to toggle back and forth between the topics. If we're talking about Orientalism, well, we just looked at dance in China. We just looked at dance in Japan. We just looked at dance in the Ottoman Empire. So this is how it gets interpreted, you know. Um, but that it's it's so important that they um, not think of this kind of work as it doesn't, it's not important to me because I'm not gonna do that work. Well, no, it's all connected. Yeah. It's all connected and it's all still being danced. So of course it matters, you know? Yeah. And it's their art form. It is th- what, what, what Boko has done by having these sites, it gives oh. kids who come in with a deficit of knowledge about dance. It gives them a way to make up for it because some kids have lived in major cities. Their parents have taken them to see modern companies and Ailey and Cunningham and Paul Taylor. And they've gone to some, you know, most people who don't live in major American cities have not seen a lot of live dance. Right. So this helps correct that deficit. Or they see a few a year that are brought into their community as you know, some kind of special program or whatever. You're right. It's, it, it, in order to build that you know, background, you, you just got to watch a lot. You You know, there's a great quote that I steal, that I have stolen, that I use all the time. Um, George O'Keefe, who of course loved Santa Fe, loved New Mexico, on a rock in front of her archive, 
in Santa Fe, downtown Santa Fe, is a quote from her that just says, take time to look. Oh, I love that. And that is my motto, you know, just look. Don't judge, just look until you know enough about it. You know, take the time to look at a lot of different dance forms and try as much as possible to take, we all have taste, we all have our own individual taste. You know, at the Joyce Theater, I had to talk about a ton of dance that I didn't love, but that wasn't my job to give my opinion. My job was to help make it make sense to an audience. And so I think that's what I'm trying to do with the students as well. It isn't about whether you like it or not. It's about what do you see? What do you see when you look at this dance? No matter where it's from, what it is, what do you see when you watch it? You know. Well, on those wise words, I think that we're going to conclude our discussion. This has really been amazing and awesome. I really appreciate it. And having your perspective uh, about these resources is just so uh, wonderful. And I think a lot of people will uh, enjoy now digging in and getting in there <laughs> and seeing, seeing what we're talking about seeing oh, what you're talking about. And I so think great. they really, really enjoy it and be amazed at what is completely open and free to all the Berkeley community through the library, um, this amazing resource. So thank you so much, Linda, for talking to us about it today at Books at Berkeley. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, well, it's a it's, discussion. It's a hu huge pleasure. I just also wanna say that Stacy set up under the study guides that Stacy so anybody Stacy Snyder set up the dance study guide that has links to everything we're talking about. That's great. Uh, right. the guides are available to anybody and you just type in the word dance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the That's library great. guide uh, at the top of the library guides and it'll show up. And so thank you again. Thank this you is, Judy. I really enjoyed this discussion. This was great. Thank you so much.